Welcome to another an amazing webinar of uh, from Ekahau. I am your host, um, or not actually, no, I am your sidekick, Stu. I am joined by my host, my co-host, Tawny. And this is Enterprise Wi-Fi Q&A, Ask the Experts. And today is going to be a really kind of a cool day uh, to kind of ask that, those blaring questions of, how do I do this? How do I do that? Or is, is, mm -hmm. is what's the best approach? And we're going to look into that. But before we do, the quick um, housekeeping. Thank you. It's going to coffee has not kicked in yet. <laughs> so I got the quick housekeeping as to, for today is if, if you do have a Q&A question that you'd like to actually get up to the panelists, please use the Q&A panel. The chat is used in for our, our general fashion of letting us know where you're from, you're liking the webinar, all that kind of cool stuff. Um, and yes, thank you, CFS. So th th now um, please put those in there. And without further ado, Tawny, take us away. Well, I'm actually going to turn the time over to our esteemed panel of experts. We're really excited. Um, you know, you guys, the attendees that we have on our webinars, absolutely, uh, you guys drive some amazing conversation and give us a lot of really great questions. And unfortunately, we don't get to them all. And so we decided that today what we were going to do is have a, a group of folks who know a little about wireless and Wi-Fi to help answer some of those questions that we don't get to. Um, but we'll start with Amy. Amy, why don't you introduce yourself? Absolutely. So I'm Amy Arnold. I'm a systems engineer with Fortinet and I'm a CWNE and I've been doing wireless a um, decade or so, lost count a little bit. So happy to be here today. Thanks, Amy. All right, JB. Hi, my name is uh, Jason Bashar and I am a mobility solutions architect. I work for a company named Velispan. Uh, and uh, I've been in mobility now for, God, it's almost been 20 years. It's scary. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. And I see lots of really good questions already rolling in. Um, before we jump to those, Keith, I think uh, a lot of people know you. A man that needs no introduction, but he does. <laughs> I do. Keith Parsons, I run a little company called Wireless Land Professionals and uh, do some podcasting and teach the ECSE courses and uh, do a little conference called WLPC. Yes, uh, and we are definitely looking forward to when that comes back in, in person, Keith. So really yeah. excited about that. Um, before we jump right into all of the questions that we're already getting, wanted to make sure for those of you who have not registered Wi-Fi Day, we have last year we had a great success with it. We had some really great speakers. Uh, this year we have uh, an also an extremely amazing, knowledgeable group of experts that are going to be speaking to us for Wi-Fi Day. So I want to make sure uh, you register www.ekahow.com slash Wi-Fi Day. And so for those of you know Ekahow, we have poll questions. And so I am going to launch that poll for everybody. And this is just something to make you smile today. Since you guys are asking us the questions, we thought we would make some fun, simple questions. Um, and so we'll, we'll get those going. Stu, cue my Jeopardy music. And we'll give just another, uh, just another couple seconds on that. I was um, just wondering about that graphic. Does that mean we're gonna have dancing at Wi-Fi day? No, it did like you see? It so looks like it's her dancing. dress. Do you see she's got Wi-Fi on her dress? Like she's just all decked out, ready to go yeah. for, for Wi-Fi day. Uh, so let's look at what those results are. But looks they're doing like little dancing moves. Defending. Yes. All right, and for those that remember, you can uh, register. That is happening May the twentieth of uh, of this of the next next month. Oh my goodness, we're already in May. It's, it's coming up fast. Yes, it is. Yes. All right. Well, let's go ahead and jump right into conversation. So, before we start the questions, why does a good Wi-Fi design matter, Keith? Oh, just jump right I'm, in. I'm there. jumping uh, right in. <laughs> I, I think I think that the best answer to the question about why does design matter is it allows us to, to look at our requirements and meet the requirements and then have a document that, that tells us what do we need and did we get it. Mm -hmm. If we just go about without a good design, we just like throw up APs, a lot of the times it actually works. It just doesn't meet all the requirements. And then when someone says, I just tried to run my voice, it didn't work. They think it was the fault of now when it was actually the fault of something that happened back in the design thing. So design allows you to meet the requirements. Awesome. Jason, what are your thoughts? Uh, so my thoughts on that is your design is the, the foundation, right, of your, your WLAN, your physical layout, your design, 
overall. And to Keith's point, one of the things about Wi-Fi is that it's so resilient that a lot of times there are problems that nine times out of 10, you might not see until an expert comes in and analyzes and looks at the overall solution and can point out some things. Um, so yeah, you know, really foundational, you know, foundational design principles and meeting those design requirements are the two biggest goals. Mm -hmm. And so Amy, you've done a lot of voice work. How important is it to have that planned out and laid out for, for a voice network, the importance of that? It's, um, it's critical because you're setting those expectations. Um, do they expect a voice to be working over this wireless? That's, a, that's an important thing too, because it changes the way you design the, the wireless network. So yeah, it's very important to gather what they expect to work, what that, um, what people want to experience, what you want that experience to be. Do you want them to be able to do video conferencing, but you don't care if the experience is all that great? Um, you really need to get those people who are going to be um, involved in managing it. I mean, there's different expectations to you and you want to align them from the client perspective, from the people who will be managing it, the people who will be implementing it. And a good design kind of ask all those questions of all of those people that will be involved. So folks, as soon as we uh, announced this webinar, we had a lot of people write in questions to us as well. And so one of the questions someone had asked was, when should I use one versus two APs per classroom in my design? Keith? I'm going to, I'm going to let you take oh, that one Oh, that's first. a tough one, eh? <laughs> uh, that, you're just trying to poke at me, make me respond there. Um, first, I'll just set, set some ground level. I've designed over 3,500 K through 12 classrooms. And over that time, we've kept statistics of, of how it works. And we normally design to, I, I call it four radio design. So you have two five gig radios and two, two four radios available in every classroom. That gives you the whatever the capacity need is, you're, you're easily covered. <clears throat> and probably between NEG 67 or NEG 65 on the primary and secondary, depending on, on the customer and what they ask for. Out of all of those 3,500, the average design is one AP per 2.6 classrooms. And with that, we can still meet that NEG 65 primary and secondary in five gig. So when people say one AP per classroom, that's a marketing term because it's easy to remember how many classrooms do you have? We need that many APs and you're done. And then you have to turn the power way down and turn off maybe three quarters of your two, four radios in order to make that work. I have seen two APs per classroom. And the first thing is you take out one of them. Um, I've seen four APs per classroom as well. And the first thing we do is we take out probably three quarters of the APs because you don't need them. Now, if you have them and it was installed and you bought that, fine. We can make one AP per classroom work. It's not a matter of not working. It's a matter of what's the most efficient way to use public funds to achieve the goal. And if the requirement is we need um, classroom, you know, 30 iPads per classroom to work, you can achieve that with way less. Yeah. Absolutely. So we're getting a lot of really good questions on antennas. What is the, um, what kind of antenna Jason, I'll pose, pose this question to you. What kind of antenna do you typically deploy in a high ceiling, 30 to 40 feet ceiling environment? And then a follow-up question to that is, how do you know what the proper antenna orientation is for that particular antenna? All right. So uh, in those type of environments, usually I will deploy something from that height of a directional nature. Uh, and again, it, it depends on where your client is. Your client could be at a ground level. Your client may be up working 30 feet in the air. So depending upon where your client is working is where in the, uh, I'm sorry, the, the antenna type will be selected for a pattern based on where that client may be working. So the second part of that question, the orientation, um, a lot of times, you know, we're not in charge when we're doing these designs, especially if they're a predictive design of the actual installation. So it's, it's very good to put together an installation document for your low voltage cabling teams to be as descriptive as possible of how to mount and orient the antennas. Uh, if you're wall mounting an antenna, for instance, not that this is a ceiling mount, but the angle that you want to mount it at, the down tilt, et cetera, uh, you want to be very specific as you can, because as we all know, low voltage teams will take their uh, 
they'll do their own thing, basically. <laughs> and you yeah. will have some interesting installations if you let them do that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's kind of interesting, you know, when you think about the, like, I, I love seeing all of the questions coming in, a lot of questions about Bluetooth, a lot of questions about the, the IoT devices. But Amy, how do you, you know, when you are doing a design and you see gaps in your design and you turn up the power to fix the gap in the AP, that's not always the right answer. So how do you determine the best transmit power for an AP in your design? So, um, you know, we're on this Ekahau webinar. So, you know, obviously <laughs> Ekahau is going to have something to do with the answer to that. Um, so yeah, turning up the power is rarely the ideal solution. Um, it's about client requirements though. And Keith would say this all the time. It's about what your requirements are. Um, I've seen situations where, you know, you've got maybe one AP at the site and you just need the coverage to go a little further and you have low data rates turn up the power that meets that requirement but really you're going to be looking at what the clients are and what those requirements are right so you need to know what kind of data rates you want to sustain you need to know what is in that atmosphere like that other rf what other rf what other ap's can see ap's your channel plan super important so mm -hmm. usually i try to do designs where i have enough room where i can adjust the power um, but I didn't, you know, you don't want to come up short. I'm, I'm a little short, but, um, <laughs> but you don't want to come up short on coverage um, because it's a lot easier to remove an AP and turn down the transmit power and say, you know, I'm just going to turn the power up here. So um, when I'm doing designs, I tend to be a little bit conservative and, and, you know, kind of go a little under where I think maybe the power might end up. And then, but knowing that you've got to come back and validate that, you've got to come back and make sure that you haven't, um, that you've planned your channels correctly, that the signal to noise ratio is good, all of those things. I think uh, you hit a really key point validation. It's so important to validate your, that your design is gonna perform as predicted because if it doesn't, then you're in a whole world of trouble on the back end of it, right? Yeah. I, I have an answer for that, a, a trick. It's, mm -hmm. It comes from ECC classes. And when you're designing, and sometimes you can't go on site early, the, the building's not built yet, et cetera. You, what you can do is you can do your design with the RF attenuation measurement that you might have picked up from the same contractor on a different building uh, or talk to the architect and found out exactly what they're going to be using and, and designed it predictively using that information. But then you go in and like photography, if you have a nice DLSR camera, you can do something called bracketing where it takes, when you pull the, push the shutter, it takes three pictures, one with the f-stop you want, one a little high, one a little low. Well, we're gonna do bracketing with Ekahau to design to say, I don't know exactly what's gonna happen, but let's find out. So you design it, you put in, uh, let's say a, a DB4 for most of your walls. And then when the design is up and running, you can go into Ekahau, choose the wall you chose, perhaps sheetrock, drywall, and change it from a three, a four to a five to a six and then adjust and say if i was wrong and the walls really were fives does my design still work now if your design can handle two three db differentials then you have a very robust design and in spite of whatever else happens in the future you know your design is solid if on the other hand you move that drywall from a four to a five and it breaks everything well, now you have a brittle design and you know that design after it gets installed, anything that could make a little subtle change might cause some issues. So even though you're using Ekahau, you're using it predictively, you can use the tool to bracket and practice and run through some examples. I would rather change the walls with that bracketing up and down than change the AP transmit power because th there's a lot of walls. There's fewer APs. So by adjusting the wall, then you can say, I'm making a robust or a brittle design. Now that's a cost difference. And that means you can go and show your customer, here's the brittle design that just barely meets the goals. It does meet the goals, but it might have issues or for, and you can calculate it up 15, 20% more. We can have a robust design that's, that can handle those kind of changes. Yeah, I, I like that to take that approach because it's really good to understand when and where your design will break and where your weaknesses are. Stu, what, what, uh, what good questions are you seeing? What questions do you think we can 
give our, well, our panelists one, here? Yeah, well, one of the things is at, um, you know, you were, you were talking about earlier is those, um, um, which is kind of where I get a lot of my background from, and, and I'll get to one in a second here, is, is, is the voice side. And, you know, not many people know that, uh, that, um, that Amy actually is, is uh, and I started in the same realm, right? Of, what was that G711, <laughs> G729, and uh, what, POTS phones and, and, you know, ATA devices, all that sort of stuff, right? So, a bit. right? <laughs> that was a very complex environment. But I can tell you the, what got me interested in Wi-Fi was this little guy right over here, right? Was the, uh, the 7920, right? I'm sure this, a lot of folks have this one. This is when we got our first start at getting really into wireless and voice at the same time. And that was probably one of the most complex environments. I mean, and even today, um, I think, um, you know, this is one probably for Amy, but I mean, today you probably would see that um, planning is even more important for voice infrastructure, like those devices that are updated or even maybe the desktop handset is now Wi-Fi because they can't cable to it, right? So there's... Um, I mean, it's, it's gotta be really important. It's a different type of planning mm -hmm. um, for, for devices like that, whether they're mobile or stationary. Yeah, well, voice has changed so dramatically uh, over the last decade, right? Um, and, and as Amy was alluding to earlier, the planning for that is so critical in understanding that. Um, but speaking of cabling, elevators, cabling I, and elevators, Wi-Fi and elevators. Just make that question. <laughs> So I know Keith and I both have some thoughts on that. Keith, do you want to you want to go first? Or do you want me to take this one first? I'll let you take this one first since you tried that handoff and it didn't work. All right, all right, perfect. So uh, there's a couple different ways that we've approached this uh, in the past that, uh, that on projects at least that I've worked on, um, and it really depends on what the regulations and the building code is in your jurisdiction. Uh, we've done the top-down uh, uh, bridged approach where we would place an access point uh, in the top of an elevator shaft and then bridge it to another access point on top of the elevator and then servicing clients in the elevator that way. Or my preferred method is that if there is an ethernet run in the umbilical cable of the, uh, the elevator that can uh, connect an access point, you jack into that, place your access point on your car, and then you have uh, Wi-Fi within your elevator, right? Without having to do a bridge from the top of each one of your uh, elevator shafts to your cars. I totally agree. If you can get anything in the traveler or the umbilical, way superior. Even if they don't have ethernet cable, they have power because there's always lights inside there. So you can use ethernet over power and it might be really restricted, maybe down to 10 meg, but you only have one car worth of people connected. So even with you, you put the AP in the car, like you said, and if you have to use ethernet over power, not power over ethernet, the opposite, and you get 10 meg, 10 meg is still better than nothing and it's consistent. What I have found when you have really tall buildings, that outside thing, once you get above probably around 20, 25 floors, you're gonna have to put one on top and one on the bottom. Sure. And then you're gonna have to have those automatically switch. And any, even though the car is moving up and down and inside the room is stable, that bridge link is changing all the time as well. So like you, if you can get in the umbilical and the traveler, you have a much better solution. Yeah. And by the way, in the United States, National Electric Code, you will never get permission to do anything inside the shaft. You, you might get forgiveness if you did it afterward, but permission's really hard to come by. Uh, that, that, that's the same here up in Canada. That's very, uh, very strict rules on that as well. So Keith, there were some questions, um, follow-up question about the auditorium. What about large auditorium spaces in, in classrooms or in schools and things like that? Um, how do you go about design for those large rooms? And then a step further, questions relating to survey and how do you survey lecture halls and capacity to, to understand what the capacity load is going to be? Oh, those are two really big questions, but they I'll, I'll are the, the first one. <laughs> they're two different spaces. And so right. whether it's in K-12 and or even a uni, you have classrooms with a limited number. And I, I like to think of those classrooms as that's normal Wi-Fi. It's not high density, low density. It's just what the Wi-Fi design is for the building. Mm -hmm. In addition, you have other spaces. So in a hospital, the normal is there's hospital patient rooms, and then there's a nurse's station. 
Well, they have two different requirements and two different densities. Nurses get all congregated together at the beginning of the shift before they go out, and you have to handle that congregation time. Uh, cafeterias, or weird schools might call them cafetoriums, where they do a cafeteria and an auditorium together, or auditoriums, you just have to treat that as a separate space. Mm -hmm. So in ECAO, you give it a different area, and you can apply a different set of requirements to it, and then you have to meet those requirements differently. So the, the easy answer is treat each area that has a different set of requirements as a different area, assign those requirements and design them separately. It's, it's actually not that difficult to pull off. You might have different levels of density, but you just work with that. Now on the density question, there's a lot of fancy things you can do inside of equity for density, inside of ECAO, sorry. What I like to do is keep it really simple. Simple for me is the easiest way. I don't need any fancy tools and load balancing. We've seen capacity planners from Andrew Vanage, from all sorts of software places, and they're all making the same assumption, which is a series of assumptions. And it's the series that bothers me. If we have this many people, and if they all have two devices, and if the, of the three devices they have, two of them are associated, but only one of them is sending data. And if it's sending data, it's going to be then sending data at this prescribed rate. And then we have to design for that rate. We've added an if on top of an if on top of an if on top of an if. And to get those density numbers, they're all made up. And then on top of it, we're saying, oh yeah, and it's gonna be 24 seven constant. Well, that's not the way our networks work. People don't use them constantly. They're not doing the same thing over and over and over again. So the big question is, do we have association counts? That's a really easy one. You add up the devices in the room and that uses up your association table. We found over oh, the last two decades that when you get above 25 to 30 devices per AP, not in association mode, but in sending data mode, you're going to max out the airtime. Now, that's not true across the board. That's just a rule of thumb. And we know rule of thumbs are a little off, but I just use 25 as a number. And whenever you have 25 to 30, uh, above 30, what happens is they all start sharing the data. From one to 25, every new user picks up a little extra capacity because of the way RF works and the airtime fairness works and how clients access the medium every time you add another one. But once you get up to 25, we're saturating the request time and whoever gets above that just shares the time. So we, yeah, we could have an AP that handles 250 clients. That's not a problem. The problem is 250 clients are sharing the same airtime bandwidth. So they're all gonna get less and less. So think of it as you go from zero to 25, each additional user adds a little more capacity to that airtime. Above 25, they just start sharing it. Now, if you wanna squeeze that up to 30, works pretty easy. I found that that simple answer solves all sorts of problems. So whenever you need, you know, there's a, a, a cafetorium with 300 users divided by 25 and you need that many airtimes. Now, again, APs have two sets of airtime for each of them. So it's not a, a, an AP count. Anyway, that's, I hope that answered the question. It did, it did. You just got me yeah. rambling, so I went off. So. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's, it's a good conversation because speaking of, of high number of client devices, roaming is a huge part of that and being able to do that. And so someone had written in a question, um, they have really bad roaming on their network. Any suggestions on where to start for troubleshooting, sticky clients, things like that? So any suggestions or thoughts on what they can do to fix some of the roaming issues on their network? Amy, yeah. you wanna take that one first? I'll, I'll take a <laughs> shot at that. So first you're gonna need to decide, figure out, you know, kind of isolate what the problem is, right? And any network troubleshooting, wireless troubleshooting, especially, you've gotta figure out, you know, same questions. When's it happening? What's it happening to you? What does the RF environment see at the time? And for me, I like to, to get out packet captures. Um, any excuse to fire up a packet capture is great. Um, so you want to see, you know, what what did the, did the client try to roam? What what was the reason code? You know, did did the APC a roam happen? Um, but sometimes it's maybe jumping the, the shark a little bit. Maybe first you want to get a spectrum analyzer or you want to look at logs and see what's going on in that environment, right? <laughs> right. 
um, you 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 want to kind of start troubleshooting it and breaking it down. So whichever direction you try to go, and it just depends on what you're finding, right? Like if it's one particular client or type of client that's having the problem, well, okay, maybe it's it's that client. But if it's you know everything in that environment can't roam pr properly. Um, then maybe you're looking at a, a more a, an issue with configuration on your wireless controller or a coverage issue or something like that. So it really depends on what those first few troubleshooting steps show you. And I think that's important to understand is, you know, even if you have a really great design when it started, sometimes a good design can go bad or something else is impacting it, causing your, you need to redesign, you need to troubleshoot, you need to do some of those things. Um, but before we jump into that, Jason, someone was asking a question, what are some general best practices for warehousing design? Uh, some general, so really it depends. <laughs> There's that old where I got to pay somebody. <laughs> so it, it depends on what you're designing for. Uh, let's, let's take, for example, we're designing for Honeywell and zebra barcode scanners, right? Uh, so generally, you know, warehousing, you have uh, highly populated racks, dynamic inventories, things that shift. Uh, this may dovetail into another one of the questions there about what some of the best settings are for auto parameters and some of these, you know, how a, a bad configuration can make a good design go poorly. So what we try to do is match up that the, the WLAN infrastructure to the clients, right? First, we might start with power settings. So I might go into my RRM values and set minimum and maximum values, right? The, uh, the automatic, you know, a lot of vendors will lead you to believe that a lot of these settings are set it and forget it. A couple specifically uh, in particular that call themselves the easy button. Uh, they are not, right? There are definitely some values here that we want to configure, min and max power levels. Uh, we want to configure basic rates that are conducive to your network environment. And what's that mean? I, I did see a question up there. Somebody asked about, well, what basic rate should we use? That really depends upon a, a few factors, right? What is your overall AP layout and is your density support a specific basic rate? Ideally, we'd like to use higher basic rates because we use the airtime more efficiently. However, if you don't have the density to support that, then we get a lot of things like retries between clients, near far issues, and a host of other RF issues that we don't want in the environment that can be detrimental. So, uh, sorry, but we're talking about rambling and I just did it. <laughs> well, well, Jason, Jason, you know, you bring up a really good point is when you're, you know, that planning is, well, uh, how many APs do I need for a warehouse? They always ask that. Well, obviously it, it depends, but is always that use case, right? I mean, how do you go about planning? Um, I mean, obviously you have to take it, take warehouse design and office design as a completely different um, variable Absolutely. where you may have a warehouse and then you've got the office within the warehouse, like right there, that's where all the uh, the, uh, yeah, the yeah. you know, the, the logistics VPs sit, every the directors, they, they sit there. You know what I mean? It's perfect. There's point. a big difference, right? I do. I treat that as two separate instances. Now let's say we, we live in Cisco land and I'll give a quick example. I might set up two separate AP groups, one for an air office, one for a warehouse, let's say 40 meg wide channels in an office because I can get away with that there. And you know, our execs need a little bit better throughput. I do 20 megs in the, in the warehouse and I use the parameters that specifically I want in the warehouse versus the office. So that's, that's one way that I can split that up and have two separate design requirements and uh, uh, design parameters for areas that are co-located. I'll, I'll just chime in here a little on the, the basic rate issue. I think it's a really good question. And the answer to basic rate is the same answer to transmit power on a lot of, and a whole bunch of other configs you might wanna do. And what I like to do is do in marketing, this shout out to Tony, we call it A-B testing. <laughs> but in, in Wi-Fi, I wanna hold everything constant and change one variable and then find out whether or not it hurt or helped. The metrics I want to watch are retry rates, average data rate, average MCS. So we set the basic, you know, minimum basic rate at six meg and let it run for an hour and see what the normal class, the normal traffic is in that arena area, wherever you are. And then after an hour, look at what the average MCS, average retry, average data rates are, mark them down, then adjust the basic rate, move it up to 12. Let it run another hour, move it to 
18, 24, 36. And what's going to happen at some point, your basic rate's going to climb. And along with it, your data rate should also, your average data rate should increase because when we went from six to 12, there's no more sixes getting averaged in. So the average is going to climb as well. But watch the retry rate. And what happens at one point, it's going to break and split. The increase in your average data rate is going to keep going because you're forcing it by changing the minimum rate. At some point, though, your retry is going to take off. You pushed it too hard. Back it off one level, and then you found the sweet spot. Same with uh, transmit power. Yes, you could go full transmit or not, as Amy discussed, or some people believe, I'm not a believer, but some people believe all you do is you, you match it to the client. What I've found is you might start matching it to the client, and then you adjust it up and down. At some point, when you adjust to transmit power, your retry rate is going to increase. You pushed it too hard, then back off. So you can self-tune your own networks to find where that sweet spot is. Wi-Fi isn't a set it and forget it. We've got to, we've got to tune it. Now, if you trust um, the automatic systems, great. They may do that. Uh, some automatic systems have a feedback loop to clients. Other automatic systems only have a feedback loop from APs to controller. I like to see the client side and the client side always, they self-announce what they're doing because every client, when it's going to transmit a frame, chooses its data rate. If there's a retry, it wasn't its fault. It wanted to send it good, but it got a, a retry. So we can use metrics packets, captures, as Amy alerted mm -hmm. to, to find out where the best thing is and then tune our network to be as good as possible. I, I, I like that met methodology, mm -hmm. Keith. That's that's really key is you, you, you've gotten right into the, not so much into the weeds, but kind of highlighted the importance mm -hmm. of, of finding that sweet spot for, your, for those critical devices. Yeah. And to refer back to Jason's last question, oh. in the office, that's different than in the warehouse. That's two different tests. They're two different areas. Or in the classroom versus the cafeteria, or at the nurse's station versus the room. Mm -hmm. yeah, every area has its own set of requirements and its own testing. Amy, what were your thoughts? Um, yeah, I was just going to say that um, you, it, what he's saying is you have to, to watch that and tune one thing at a time. So a lot of people like to go, I and mean, we tend to try to turn all the knobs at once. And then how do you know if you fixed it? And then you have to know what you're looking for um, to know if that change was good or bad. Um, so those are really important things to consider is the impact of what it is that you're changing. Only control that change so that you can tell if you made a difference or not. Yeah, I agree. I think that's one of the things that I do, a very systematic approach to it. I figure out what the problem is and then I try this thing. Did that change? Did that impact it? Did it break something else? Did it do, you know, something else that I didn't, wasn't thinking of? And then I kind of go through my process and, and do it that way to, to be very methodical in that way so that I can really understand what changes I'm making, how it's impacting and did it fix or break the problem better or worse? Right. Yeah, absolutely. So let's switch gears. Uh, a lot of questions about outdoor deployments and should you use mesh should you use you know ap's yep. mounted on buildings uh let's let's talk about some best practices for outdoor deployments and then best practices for validating those deployments who wants to take that one i know amy's affinity for mesh deployments so <laughs> yes yeah I, I can i can answer that one no <laughs> no uh, no actually so it depends and um, sometimes mesh is what you have to work with right mm -hmm. and and but i would in my experience just try to avoid it like the plague um <laughs> if you can um because there is a lot of you get a lot of interesting um things to troubleshoot when you do that so if you really like to troubleshoot interesting problems by all means you know mesh is maybe the way to go but um honestly you're going to get a better experience if you can have a wired ap so um and if there's a way to do it um definitely try to do that Outdoors is, um, is one of those things to me and my experience where there's the ideal and how you want it to be. And then there's reality, which is, you know, people can, things can come in, they can build apartment complexes between your point to point links. Um, and you have to account for that. So there's just a lot of going back in that feedback loop and, and looking at your links later to see if they're still performing at the same way they were before. Um, and that design is even more important. You need to make sure, you know, what is in the way, what, what SNR do you want to achieve? 
Um, those are types of considerations. And then you have all of the fun of like outdoor deployments, which, you know, there's uh, outdoor network boxes, things like that, NEMA boxes. Um, how are you going to get power there? Um, these are all challenges when you're outdoors. Um, and some I've heard of, you know, like WASP getting around APs, things like that. And you're like, this is the uh, great outdoors um, that, uh, that is not like a RF problem, but like a physical um, issue to deal with. So there's a lot of challenges around that. But I would definitely recommend if you can avoid mesh, avoid mesh. So a Amy's been traumatized by mesh. I've had a bit <laughs> of a different experience in, and here's why. You um, tell. <laughs> 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 the the vertical in which I've used mesh in right so I mostly oil and gas and refinery. Um, ideally, when, when I'm I'm deploying an outdoor network, mesh was always a requirement because of the extensive cabling costs to get cable to some of these remote locations in a refinery, right? So so mesh became a really attractive option to transmit limited amounts of IoT data. What's what's now known as IoT ISA 100 data. Um, but back to the mesh, I see some of the best, uh, uh, the, the things that you can do for deploying access points outside. Of course, to Amy's point, if you can always cable them, cable them. If you can better yet, fiber to the device so that you are providing downstream protection against direct lightning strikes, do that. Uh, there's a lot of misconceptions out there about uh, arresters in antennas. Uh, antenna arresters, uh, lightning arresters will not provide your devices from downstream strikes. What it does do is it provides from the, the ambient electricity around. So people think, oh, my AP gets hit, my downstream equipment is safe. It actually is not. The only way to make sure that your downstream equipment is safe is to put something that's not conductive between it and the access point, and that would be that piece of glass or, or that fiber. So if you want absolutely uh, absolute I electrical isolation, fiber is the way to go to your access point. Um, uh, I rambled again, but that's all I have to say. <laughs> you know what? That's honestly some of the times or when you get the best answers is when you hey, just talk and you, you understand what I am good. <laughs> but I mean, on that mesh piece, it is, um, Amy is definitely right. I do agree is if when cable cable, yes. if you can, mm -hmm. please do that. Uh, it's going to offer you the best experience for the clients and the user experience. Every hop is a 50% reduction in throughput. Right. Yes. We got to worry about trees. We got to worry about, you know, things getting in the way all of a sudden, you know, oh. line of sight and understanding the 50% reduction is huge. Yeah. That's, I, put that's the the I put the AP up in the fall. That's the AP up in the fall and stop working in the spring. Yeah. yeah. And I think <laughs> the other side to replace, that. You can easily replace the mesh, every mesh link and save yourself that 50% mm -hmm. hit by putting in a point to point bridge mm -hmm. and then access yes. point on the other side. Absolutely. Which is on a completely it, different mesh is, yeah. mesh is only a salesman's thing because they go, oh, I can save you money. <laughs> that's, that's all it is. If you put in cop, uh, fiber, copper, point-to-point mm -hmm. -point link, and then mm -hmm. mesh is like the last choice you have to choose from. There's yeah. always a better decision. It's just about money. So yeah. and don't, I think don't also let mesh scare you. It's a solution that saves the customer money. That's all but it has a bunch of issues. So if you, if you don't have the money, but you still need something, it gives you something. Yeah. yeah. I think it's also important in that to understand that when you, a vendor tells you it's a one gig ethernet port and you, that's what you're going to get, that's max and that's potential and that's not reality. <laughs> and then you take what the average is and then you cut it in half again for your mesh node and understanding. So you've significantly, you've dropped it even further than what you anticipated. So understanding that um, I think it, it is, is really critical. Um, on the outdoor question, we were just talking about outdoor. One thing you also need to look at when you're outdoor, you're going to have outdoor APs have a little green lug on it for a grounding at mm -hmm. the AP location. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you should ground them for all sorts of reasons. But realize, depending on where you are, that ground is to the AP directly to the ground. It also influences the Ethernet port on the AP because it shares the ground. Back at the switch where you have that CAT6 cable coming in from the AP, it has a different, may have a different ground where the switch is plugged into the wall outlet. If those two have a differential, and in many outdoor locations they will, your ethernet cable, though you have a gig port on the switch and a gig port on the AP and CAT6 cable, it's all spec, it will drop down to only 100 meg because of the differential on ground. 
Now you won't know that and it'll look like it's a Wi-Fi issue for a long, long time. You'll do everything to try to fix it when really it's just a mismatched ground. So just because you have a gig port and you have mismatched ground, you might be getting 100 meg connections and not know why. And I have no reason why I know that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised that you do know it, but, <laughs> but uh, that's actually really interesting because the, um, the ground piece is, is critical. Uh, I will say that uh, you're doing outdoor ground, the APs, um, and usually get your cabling guys to do that or cabling folks, I should say, to do that, uh, to that work because uh, that you want to make sure that stuff is uh, secure, no matter what the height is. And, uh, and then as Jason says, you for resters as well. So someone is asking a question relating to troubleshooting. What are the most common interference equipment uh, that you get in a 2.4 gig deployment? That was the one I was going to pick. <laughs> Stu, great minds. It's, it's, we're same wavelength. It's right, right there. <laughs> uh, I want to know what the, I want to hear from our guests. What, what, I do too. Uh, I would repeat the question. I, mean, I was trying to read it. What was the question? <laughs> what are the common interference, what co are common interferences uh, with, that give us headaches in 2.4 deployments? Okay, I'll just, I'll pick number one and I'll let the other panelists take everything else. Number one, other Wi-Fi. It's your own Wi-Fi that's causing it. So <laughs> fix that first. Go ahead, guys. Keith stole my answer. Other, your own APs. You're your own worst enemy. Yes. Your own APs, Bluetooth, microwaves, uh, Wi-Fi, uh, Sonos speakers, turns out. W were we talking about protocol or non-protocol compliant? <laughs> don't know I, I would say if we're talking about non-protocol compliant definitely microwaves every, there's there's one everywhere and they leak like hell mm. if we're talking about non-protocol compliant what's what's the most common they so, leak when they're broken they, they, they do. don't leave the factory leaking well I found, yeah I, I had a job with a whole bunch of hospitals where the nurses would go and and break their microwaves because they would shut them with their hips not that this is the thing nurses do. Anytime you shut a microwave with anything other than your hand, it's going to torque it and then it's going to start to leak. A brand new microwave right from the factory never leaks. And it's very cheap to replace a microwave. L less than $100 and that's cheaper than your time when you're on site. So yeah, I would just go in and I'd stop, buy a bunch of microwaves at Walmart, go on site, replace them all. And then we would screw them down at the back of the desk or table where they're mounted. So when the door comes forward, you can't hit it with anything but your hand. And then they would last years. Even I've got microwaves a decade old that don't leak and don't cause Wi-Fi issues. Really? They're not made that way. They break and become that way. I guess everybody's seen them make kids, popcorn. So right? I don't have so. that fortunate. Uh, I do. I see people just like screaming in the chat right now. Printing. I know. <laughs> yes. Please Lots. disable your Wi-Fi direct and your Wi-Fi uh, broadcast on your HP printers because guess what? Yes, they, they, yes. They, they're, they're broadcasting. And it's Our usually TVs. like channel seven or channel 10 or something mm -hmm. really not good for Wi Fi. Well, the yeah. TV behind me, channel eight. Yeah. Right? The, TVs, printers, all of those things that now come Wi Fi enabled, which are great, are broadcasting and causing can wreak havoc on your network. Um, but speaking of that, talk about five gig only deployments. We're talking about interferences on two four. <laughs> Keith, um, <laughs> Keith loves five gig only deployments. Yes, but there's interference. <laughs> yes, there are. Who wants to go? Who wants I'll to do a short right. one? I, I love five gig deployments. I design for five gig. I test for five gig, and to me, two point four is an overlay network that you turn on after the fact. And then you minimize the 2.4 to, to achieve just what it's needed. And the biggest trick here is uh, communication with your customer. I doubt they still have many 2.4 only devices. And if they do, they know their legacy. And so throw them into a SSID that's legacy. Let them all know that it's best effort. And that's what 2.4 is for. And if they have IoT, dedicate it to IoT. I will, I will add to that and say everything that Keith just said, uh, with the exception that if a customer comes to us with a specific design requirement for something in 2.4, which interestingly enough, I, I had this morning on a call for a, uh, an industrial plant. Um, 
we'll take that into account. But generally, yes, we'll always design for five gigahertz. Uh, you know, we will look, uh, I did a, well, I can't talk about that yet, but uh, let's say, just say I did a job that I had some interference on what I often see in five gigahertz. And this is the second time now I've seen it in my career, these interesting little devices that are motion detectors and stairwells. And you will find out that they run in high frequency RF. And if you read into their data sheet a little bit further, you'll see that that high frequency RF is 5.8 gigahertz. So they destroy everything in the Uni3. And I'm starting to find those more and more in five gigahertz only deployments. Not that it's, I mean, like I said, not that we designed for anything else, but I'm starting to see more interferes in five gigahertz like I have in two four than I've typically seen in the past in five. That's, that's interesting. I, I um, uh, definitely seeing more of that. that, that I, I want to know more, right? I, I want to see that in, in, in action, right? Actually, I, 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 if I had it queued up right now, I'd love to show you, but the sidekick was actually instrumental in helping capture that data up in, you know, channels 157 up through 165. And, and I think as we move to six gig coming up quite soon, we'll see even more because people have been throwing stuff up there not caring quite so much. And thinking it was in that little group, it's you no, know, it's not quite Wi-Fi. It's at the high end; they'll be okay. Um, yeah, it's gonna, it's, it's gonna come back to bite us. Isn't that how we treated two, four, and five, Keith? Like you know, five, five is the high end, you know, and then and now it's now it's the low end. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, folks. Um, there are just a lot of questions <laughs> we're trying to we're trying to get through them all i think Stu, what this tells us is we need to do this again um and does. to be able to get through all of the all of the questions um but someone was asking a really good question when designing uh, a five gig network in a building that is all metal frame what should they look out for what should the points you know what what are the the things to to make sure that they take it into consideration how, how many buildings are metal frame i i, I think just about every enterprise class building I've been in in the last decade is metal frame. So you just treat it, it's, it's just what you, you, you follow the same things, you get the requirements, you measure the walls, you do the design, you validate it afterward. I haven't seen anything unique about that. Um, Jason, I mean, I'm guessing most of your buildings have metal frames too. Yeah, I mean, if we're talking about standard office buildings, but all the, all the frames are generally, uh, or all the studs are metal frames. Um, you know, warehousing, like, a, you know, you have to give me a little bit more to go on. I don't see a whole lot of degradation now, like a new construction where, you know, you would think a wall might be a 4 dB attenuation value, even with metal in it. You go and you do some attenuation uh, readings or AP setups, and they're closer to two, right? So the metal doesn't make all, a whole lot of difference. I, I would mention, though, if, if you find metal pieces that you think you're going to attach an AP to, think twice. Move it away from a chunk of metal, a, a beam, an I-beam or whatever. Try to keep your APs away from that. Don't use that as a, as a backplane. It causes things that are, are just no fun. Yeah, I, I will agree with that. One other thing that I will say is looking at building construction, you know, in, in my course of my wireless career, you know, looking at older buildings that had wood and like stucco versus metal frame, I will say now, especially with the, the advent of MIMO, uh, we're getting reflections through those walls, right, that we normally probably didn't get before prior to that when, when we were using wooden studs and the RF was absorbed. So we're getting more reflections that actually come through those walls. So in my opinion, I think that the, probably the metal frames benefit a little bit more than some of the older construction. Until you go a little too much. I've, I've tried to show customers who say, we want to hide our APs above the ceiling tile. And up above the ceiling tile, there's all the duct work. And yeah, the, no. the problem is, for MIMO to work, we need multipath. And for spatial streams to work, we need the multipath to be discernible. And what happens when you have too much multipath is the receiving chip can't differentiate between the paths, and you just get a whole lot of garbage. Noise. And so by hanging it below that area, you're still going to get the same signal strength, but you'll get a clean spatial stream, which is going to give you higher throughput. And so I've had customers say, well, we put the APs above the ceiling tile and we get the same SNR. Yeah, but you're not going to get the same throughput. 
And it's because of the MIMO effects that happen because of multipath, which then allows us to have spatial streams, but we need those spatial streams differentiable, if that's a word. If no. not, Keith just made it up today. What was it? <laughs> Differentiable. I like it. I'm, I'm going to, if we were playing Scrabble right now, I would allow it. <laughs> but you, you know, that's a really great, and I, and, and that Keith is, is a lot of folks forget that uh, how Wi-Fi works. And that's one of the things we've seen it uh, in, in, in sessions at, um, at uh, WLAN, you know, pros is where we see, mm -hmm. you know, how to place APs, right? Is if we're placing them above a ceiling tile, we've got to deal with whatever that ceiling tile is, or you decided mm -hmm. to put a behind drywall ceiling. Like, why would you put it behind a finished ceiling drywall? I mean, I know there's, um, there's lots of our friends out there that create specific um, flush enclosures, right? That are a mm -hmm. thin plastic that allow, um, you know, um, the, the signal to actually, uh, to actually penetrate out properly. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's for the aesthetics, right? There's a P there's, there's something for that, but um, yeah, you want to, get away from uh, incorrectly putting Wi-Fi in a, in a bad place. Mm -hmm. Just, just to, to go back in way, way history, when uh, MIMO first came out and we wanted, we now, before it was in B and A really hated multipath. And so it caused a lot of issues. We, we had a different type of antenna system where we only, only one would work and we throw them out. And then now we have chipsets that can decode that. So we thought, we should make an AP bracket that induces multipath. And then we started down the path of figuring out how to do that. What's the angles of it to, to in, so they don't go back together, they get spread out. And we found that the US government had already done all the research. We found a research paper on the back of a F-117 that kind of a, it looked like a triangle plane on the back wing was a different shape, which they ran modeling on. So the radar would hit and disperse. So it wouldn't come back. So we just copied that exact line, built it into a, a AP bracket. Now this is a long time ago. This was AP 1200s from Cisco and it worked fantastic. We could induce multipath every single time. The bracket just weighed about 12 pounds. Oh. Holy cow. <laughs> and it was really, really ugly. Still so I think I think of our first production run, we sold four. Yeah. You have one? Uh, Excuse me. No, we used them for skeet shooting once. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Mm. Uh, All Tony, right, folks, I don't know. Getting... Tony, those sorry, Tony, the questions in here are actually really good. And there's I know, a lot I, of stuff I... in here that we could capture and cover. We're... Yeah, we're, we're getting to the top of the hour. Um, and I know we haven't hit everybody's questions. We're sorry. We're, we're trying to get through a lot of those. Um, these folks, you know, Keith, Amy, and Jason absolutely would be willing to answer any questions everybody has on Twitter. Feel free to ping them, to ask them questions. Um, we'll put their contact up here in a minute. Um, but someone was asking a question and I thought was kind of interesting. What are your thoughts on utilizing DCS channels? Yeah, that's a good one. That? I'm going to DFS say DFS channels. Does, you use them before you can. Yes, yeah, sorry, DFS channel. I'm, I'm I'm going to say before Keith does already. I'm use them until you can't. Uh, if you have uh, areas that are concerning for DFS events, mm -hmm. don't use DFS channels. If you can get away with utilizing DFS channels, by all means, take advantage of all of that beautiful spectrum out there that's begging for people to use it. Yep. Okay, I'm yep. done. I completely agree. <laughs> Awesome. The, the other thing you can do is if you if you need extra capacity, but you do have the problem that Jason said, you, you have clients that can't use DFS and you have to support them, you can uh, design and salt and pepper them, put a DFS, non-DFS, DFS, non-DFS, non so that every area, the, the devices that must have a non-DFS in order to work will still have coverage. They might not have secondary coverage, but they will have a primary everywhere. And I have yet to find a device that couldn't support DFS channels, could not support DFS channels, but required primary and secondary. So that is a solution. You have to kind of manually do the design. I don't know of any automatic system that will do that salt and peppering, but it is a solution. We've used it and it does work. Yeah, absolutely. We have too many acronyms in, in Wi-Fi, by the way. Yes. <laughs> It's like alphabet soup sometimes when you're thinking about stuff. All right. So as we uh, wrap up here, um, 
Amy, any final thoughts for folks uh, about design and, and how to just go about making wireless work? Sure. I would say always get the client requirements and understand the rules so that when you have to break them, and you will, I mean, and you, you just need to know what you're, the impact of the choices that you're, you're making. Um, so, so those client requirements and understanding how it works so that when you have to do something that you might think is janky or a little different, a little off the standard, you know what you're doing and why you're doing it so that it'll work the way you think it will. Jason, your thoughts. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Understand what the requirements are for the devices that you are designing a WLAN for. And most commonly, that's what we call our LCMI, or our least capable, most important device. Find out what that device is, test against it, design for it. And I think the important thing to remember is design what you test for, test what you design. Absolutely. Uh, Keith. Um, document. Document everything. Document before, during, after. I even have uh, downstairs in the lab, I have every client test device that I've ever used as a test. So that six years later when they go, this isn't working. I said, well, we designed it to run on a, on a Galaxy S3. Let's bring out the Galaxy S3 and let's test it. <gasps> Amazing, it still works exactly as it was supposed to for that device that you paid me for. <laughs> Oh, you want a new one? Okay, let's renegotiate. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but folks, before we end here today, we do have our second poll question we're going to ask. Um, if you like this format, let us know. If you uh, there are things that you would like to see, let us know because we really take into account the feedback from everyone so that way we can make these valuable for, for everybody and make sure that we're bringing content that uh, folks need and, and want to hear. So if you ever do have suggestions, please feel free to reach out to Stu or myself, and we'll be more than happy to, to get that in. Or if you want to be a guest on a webinar, let us know, uh, and we'd love to have folks join us. So that really, that works out really, really well for us. Um, we like case studies. We like to, to see those things too. Um, but with that, thank you everybody for joining us today. Thank you to our esteemed panel of experts. We'll stay on here folks a few minutes after and try to get to some of these additional questions. Um, but Amy, Keith, Jason, thank you so much for joining us today and taking the time. This was absolutely fantastic. We absolutely loved having you on and being able to, to answer some of these questions for, for our folks. Thanks for having us. And with that, hey guys, I just popped on. I want to say thanks. Hi, Jeff. Hey, we have, well, we Jeff. have Jeff on. <laughs> How are you? I'm, I'm, I have cardboard boxes all over myself. We're up to my <laughs> neck and moving, and just the pleasure that all of that is. Oh, well, I don't envy you. Yeah. All right. And with that, we will uh, end the recording and we will stop it there.